we're doing something that has to be done and it is shipping my 1971 Ovation Breadwinner away to be repaired. It works, nothing major is wrong, but uh, it's just, I think it might need a new potentiometer. I think it just needs a tune up, get the intonation, just get it refurbished because it's been a while. We're sending it off to the guitologist. You may have heard of him. Not taking any chances with this thing. That's for damn sure. All right, now I gotta slap the address on there and we're off. No, I think that's good. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. <clears throat> Shipping this guitar. It's going to Louisville. Are you tired of watching hours of confusing videos by guitar music theory experts on YouTube and still not understanding a darn thing they're on about? Then you need Song, the Guitar Chord Family app. Song organizes 6,000 guitar chords into their relative major and minor keys, showing you all the ones that sound good together. Downloading Song is like downloading music theory straight into your brain. Try it now for free. Link is in the description. I think I've got a delivery. Hey, how are you doing? Okay, so. <laughs> it looks like it's maybe in one piece. I'm, I'm shocked. He's got a couple of rounds of tape over on this end. Th look, this latch is, out, is off. See this latch on this end? So I guess it's a good thing he, he taped it. One piece of tape extra. So there's <laughs> one, two, three, four pieces of tape. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is great. This is not the way to ship things. If you ever do it again, um, yeah, you'll probably want to do this a little bit differently. But let's uh, let's open up the guitar and check it out and. Uh, We'll see what Matthew needs us to do with it. Okay, so let's see how far you can ship a guitar through UPS and have it arrive in one piece, all right? This has come from all the way from uh, Sandy, Utah to Louisville, Kentucky. I don't know how many thousands of miles that is, but it's a long way. So let's see how far it can go. And if it made it in one piece... Uh, did the neck pocket survive? Looks like it survived in one piece. I don't think it cracked or anything. No neck cracks or anything like that that I can tell so far. I think he might have gotten away with this and I'm actually pretty shocked that he was able to ship a guitar just in a case. <laughs> I mean Okay, so here we are on the bench with this breadwinner guitar, and this thing has quite a long and interesting story to it, according to Matthew. He said his uncle had actually given him some of this stuff, gave him this bridge pickup, and uh, the wiring harness came out of something else. Uh, we want to look this thing over and just get an overview of just how strange and interesting uh, this guitar actually is. We have this uh, bridge here which is kind of a it's like a plastic um, some kind of molded plastic and we also have a, sort of a molded plastic or I don't know if it's a nylon or whatever saddle right there as well the bridge pickup is a super distortion the ring around this is solid brass he said his uncle made this this is an original pickup now they made I think a couple different versions of this guitar with different pickups in it. He said he didn't care for the, this pickup and he said he thought maybe it had some kind of toroidal, I think the words he used were uh, ter toroidal design. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at any specifications on this. I'm coming to this completely uh, cold here. So just looking it over with you guys. But I can tell that this thing is very high quality just simply because of the 
attention to detail the types of co uh, components materials used this is actual ebony on the fretboard the very nice fretboard the frets seem to be okay i don't know if he's had fret work done at some point somebody must have done some fret work at some point because to be from the 70s and he said this thing has played hundreds of shows just since he's had it and uh to be this old and to have played that many shows and to have that little fretware is pretty remarkable. So either somebody has refretted this or somebody at some point uh, took some you know high frets with some uh, divots and dimples in them and, and uh, leveled and crowned and, and all that stuff. So that's already been done it looks like to some degree so I don't think uh, that's something we'll have to do here. Very interesting end of the fretboard there. What does that remind you of? They just took the headstock of a Gibson and stuck it on the end of the fretboard and said, screw you. <laughs> Play authentic. You got to admire it. Again, they made a couple different configurations of this, but I've seen them with the uh, jack, not here on the side like it is on this one, but I've seen it with the jack up here on top and then two switches as well. So you should see a jack and two switches and then these two knobs. This knob might be original. I think some of the ones that I've seen uh, had a knob that was very similar to this. Uh, we've got this knob obviously is not original. I don't see how he even uses that. Since recording these clips, I was able to do some more research on the Breadwinner model and it has a very interesting history to tell. The Breadwinner was one of three models that shared the same shape. The other two were the Deacon, which had fancier diamond fretboard inlays, fretboard binding and transparent finish options and the Breadwinner Limited model, which seems to have come later and featured another body cut on the low E side. Only around 500 of this latter model were produced. The early Breadwinner guitars came with a special finish called Lyracord, which is the same patented fiberglass and resin material used to form the backs of Ovation acoustic guitars. It has a distinctive concrete-like texture and is a very durable finish, which helps hide imperfections with age. That's why so many of these that you see look really, really nice, even so far into the future. The Breadwinner Deacon line came with Active Fet Electronics, which appears to be the first of its kind to be mass-produced in the United States. There were at least three different wiring circuits which existed during the lifetime of the line, two of which included the early ones with the oversized single quill pickups and Active Fet Electronics and later passive models with humbuckers. The active circuits were powered by two 9-volt batteries in series for 18 volts total. According to another source, which I will link in the description, the designer of the Breadwinner, whom we only know as Mike in this interview, states, I worked at Ovation Instruments in 1971 as a commercial artist in their advertising public relations department. My primary job was print advertising and sales promotion. One day in 1971, Jim Ricard, the chief engineer, asked me to submit sketches for a solid body electric that they were contemplating producing. I did and the breadwinner Deacon was one of them. I left Ovation shortly after that due to a company-wide layoff. I never got to see my guitar made. Years later while watching TV I saw David Cassidy playing a breadwinner on a rerun of the Partridge Family Show. I was thrilled to say the least. Famous users of the breadwinner Deacon line include Mark Bolin of T-Rex, Robert Smith, while with Susie and the Banshees, and Ace Frehley, who we see pictured with one here during a 1972 rehearsal. He says he's the type of player, and I consulted with him at length on this just to see what he wants to do, um, what kind of modifications, if any, he wants to make to this thing. Basically, he wants this thing brought up to snuff and brought up to scratch. Uh, he's doing some recording and I told him I said you know this would be a prime time to do that with this what you want to do with it you know to make it what you want it to be like for instance we've got this neck pickup just flop in here I said if you don't like this neck pick neck pickup we can actually um, take it out and replace it and he said actually um, and he kind of thought you know maybe that might be cool also but then after we got to talking at length I said well this would also be a good time probably just to get rid of this wiring harness because this is not the original wiring harness anyway like I said this came out of something else so just to get rid of the wiring harness uh, keep the super distortion pickup which he likes and then just go to a single volume pot and nothing else, no tone pot, because he doesn't use his tone knobs at all. And he's like a lot of players in that regard. I said, you know, you really don't need it if you don't use it, so we could just bypass, we could leave the tone knob off of this thing, 
uh, and he said, yeah, you know, while we're at it too, just, just, you know, maybe just leave that pickup completely out. And I said, well, we can just cut a different pick guard. Anyway, I bought a pick guard blank on eBay that's uh, on its way, and we're going to make a new pick guard for this thing. Uh, we'll also transplant this pickup into, onto the new pick guard with, with this ring. He wants to keep the ring. But he, he said just eliminate the neck pickup and just read, when you redo the pick guard, he said just leave that with no hole. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a cool one. I think first thing we're going to do here is uh, remove the strings. We may remove the neck also just to see uh, what's under the neck pocket to see what kind of weird construction oddities we find under there yeah man just an interesting uh interesting old vintage guitar new hartford connecticut ovation instruments number 901 but yeah so there we are uh with this ovation let's go ahead and turn it over again and we'll clip the strings and uh remove that pit guard see what's underneath that pit guard just looking at the nut it looks like it is bone perhaps and it looks like maybe it's non-original it's not that it's badly cut, it just doesn't fit perfectly here on the ends. Which we probably won't mess with. I mean, the setup and everything seems okay, but we'll we'll definitely adjust that as well while we have it. Adjust the intonation, all that stuff, of course. This is uh, basically going to be a setup and kind of a uh, pimp my guitar style thing here. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get the... Uh... Yeah, see, I don't like this at all because it's you've got these ball ends that are down underneath the, the body. I think it almost might be beneficial to uh, shim the neck or cock the neck back slightly and and be able to raise this up somewhat so you don't have to struggle with these strings. You see what I mean? That's not, that's really not ideal, is it? Man, if you had to do this in the uh, middle of a show, you know? And he said also this was his only guitar that he's got at the moment. Like his only guitar. <laughs> he doesn't play, not that this is his number one, but this this is the only guitar he has. It's just every other guitar he's had, he's sold, so. But yeah, see that is, that is really not ideal having those uh, ball ends just that far down like that. And look, also, you can't really do the in much with the intonation either with it that far down. So I think this might be a case where, while we've got this thing all apart and everything, we may shim this neck to give it a slightly different angle so that we can raise this up. And then, uh, you know, of course, we'll have, we might have to adjust the pickup uh, at the end of the day, but... It's much better to have this up so that so that you can access everything back here properly. That's one one thing I see that definitely I I would like to change. These are not fender style screws either. These pit guard screws. These are these are really tiny. So I don't want to lose any. Um, I probably do have some this small, but. I'd have to look in my stash and see what all I've got. I've got a couple. Reason I say that's because there's a couple that are missing. It wouldn't surprise me if they were stripped out, and I have to do the uh, toothpick trick on it. That's not an original screw. The one I just took out. It's like a brass something or other. So there's that part. We just got a ground wire to take off now. Got a bunch of foam in here that's uh, helping to prop up the DiMarzio and keep it from making noise and flopping around. Um, but he said these pots, supposedly the wiring harness was out of a 60s SG, but I, the only thing I'm seeing that might even be 60s SG would be this pot. I think this pot had been replaced by the time he had gotten the wiring harness, so that pot is a newer pot. So it's nothing old or special. This one, let's see. This one is, this is actually 1972, this pot. So this, this pot's probably original to the guitar. I don't know, I think he may have been mistaken on the wiring harness aspect, because this is a, this is a 1972 pot. Fifth week of 1972. 
right there. And that's also not a CTS pod. It is a, uh, what is 304? I forget. Um, it's not stack pole, is it? I can't, I don't know. Anyway, that's a 72 pot. So that's probably original to this guitar. So that would date this guitar to a 1972. Uh, and again, the CTS right here has been replaced. That's, that's a newer one. Um, and then we, of course, have a this vintage, lovely vintage DiMarzio. Yeah, lovely pickup. Old vintage DiMarzio. You can see just by the patina on that, that's a pretty old one. He said it, it was a 70s DiMarzio, and I believe him. I'm not even sure how to date uh, old DiMarzios like that. I'm not even sure that if you can. But uh, but there it is, very nice. So let's tell you what, let's desolder this from the ground, and we'll desolder this pickup as well, and go ahead and yank it out, and we'll just basically go ahead and prepare uh, to get this thing ready for its uh, new uh, pick guard update. And actually, before we go any further here, just look at the state of this wiring harness with all this. Uh, tape and everything that's on there that piece of tape fell off but I mean all of the connections have just basically been spliced and taped so the whole thing is just kind of bodged in here and not done professionally at all so this is certainly going to be an up uh, an upgrade over what he's got now uh, we'll also another thing we're uh, gonna do um, we'll have to remember to do this uh, to put our uh, shielding on the underside of the pick guard and uh, we'll wire our ground wire and everything to that so that we get good shielding uh, all the way around all the electronics so uh, that'll be an upgrade too we can actually even extend the shielding all the way out to so kind of surround the pickup if we want which we may do and it could help in some measure so we'll do all of that but yeah I just wanted to show you this this real bodge job that we've got going on here that I mean this this, I'm not sure why it's all wrapped because, well, I guess he didn't want it grounding out against any of this. So that that's why that part is wrapped. I suppose that's probably a good idea. But yeah, we can definitely do much, much better than this. So there's the whole pit guard assembly out. And uh, he didn't have the neck pickup hooked up at all. It's just uh, dangling there, I guess, or doesn't have any wires at all. Um, so it wasn't even hooked up to anything. So no need to, I guess disconnected from anything but yeah so this is a 72 pot and this is a newer pot so we'll probably reuse this pot right here in our new wiring scheme so he doesn't have to buy a new pot okay so here is the pickup that was in this thing check this thing out this is uh this is really this is really an interesting bit of kit here i've never seen anything quite like it it's got this plastic side on it i'm not even sure how you would get this thing apart short of uh, taking this foam off the bottom and then kind of maybe seeing from there but it's got this plate on the bottom I don't know if that says if that's supposed to say 10k maybe this thing is measures 10k but it's heavy man this is the biggest I mean okay so look at the difference here in the size of the pickup here's a regular humbucker and look at this monster just a massive massive th I mean this this thing weighs as much as two regular humbuckers that's that thing is massive so that would definitely be interesting to hear what that sounded like but uh, we're not going to get the opportunity unfortunately because he does he said he didn't he never liked the tone of these so we're gonna leave it out he shipped the uh, payment for the service uh, back here which I've already gotten out but there's also a some kind of rock in here I don't know I don't know exactly what this is. It's some kind of semi-precious stone. I think he actually mentioned something about this when he first sent it, but I forget what he said about that. I'll have to ask him what's up with that. Maybe that's a good luck charm that's supposed to stay in the guitar.
you can see there's the rough edge so there's what I start with and then beveling it you end up with something more like this it looks more like a finished product Okay, so the pick guard is pretty much done now. We're gonna turn our attention to the electronics. I'm just gonna basically desolder. Well, I don't have to desolder half of it. <laughs> I guess I think that's the ground. All right, let's do something about that. No big deal. There's some extension wire. That's what this little splice is. That's just extending that wire. So I'm, I'm just gonna take all of this uh, tape off. And we'll see a little bit better what we're dealing with here. I'm guessing that's ground. I guess that's the ground wire and that's the hot. I don't know what all, why there would be two wires here though. So the reason this has two conductors and a shield is because this is a vintage 70s dual sound super distortion, not just the regular super distortion. The dual sound was first offered in 1974 and is still available today. We got two conductors and ground right there. 13.7K, look at that. Now, looks like, yeah, I did scratch it a little bit right up in there, unfortunately. Got a little scratch right there as well. Oh, wait, do we have two? Oh, do we have two? We have two layers of plastic. Ooh, did that save me? Looks like that maybe saved me. Oh, it did save me. Look at that. It had two layers of plastic on it. And that saved me from having to uh, do anything to this. That's brilliant. That is mint. See, I had some scratches up in here where I, my tool slipped. And then I had a couple down here as well, sort of where it, where it slipped. But that's awesome that they had two layers of plastic on there. So that saved me. <laughs> Whoops, I forgot the shielding tape. I knew I was getting ahead of myself. I think one more piece will probably get us where we need to go. I want to like to connect it up to these couple of screws at least that are here for the pickup. Okay, so there's our shielded pit guard. Okay, so this bridge, the problem with this bridge, uh, I think is that the screw that mounts it, this one, uh, was screwed in too tightly in the back. Uh, that's why it was dragged down as far as it was. I think if it was screwed in less tightly, um, these ball ends would not sink down in the body like they were. So um, we'll try that and see. I think there's enough, there's plenty of angle there over these saddles. So there's no reason I don't think why that should be dipped down like that. One thing I do notice is that uh, there's no shielding here. There might be some shielded, there might be some paint shielding uh, here, but I just don't, I can't tell. So I'm going to go ahead and shield this cavity at, at least um, so that we get a complete Faraday cage. First, I've got to suck out some debris that's in there.
Also, one thing I did have to do uh, is drill a, a, just a very shallow hole here and a very shallow one here um, to accommodate the screws for because he wanted to keep that uh, mounting ring for the pickup and uh, the screws that I had to use on that were s slightly longer than I guess his old ones but actually that's not true his old ones were sticking into the uh, the body right here and actually raising up the pick guard in this area so it was it wasn't even flat against the body right here so to fix that I just drilled this very very shallow hole right here and right here to accommodate that so it'll all set down flush and like I said, we're going to put some more shielding tape in this cavity and try to make this a complete Faraday cage here for noise reasons. I was also having some, uh, some audio issues at this station over here in some of the previous clips. I'm sure you noticed that. Um, I really, I didn't have time to troubleshoot it when I was messing with this thing last night, so I just went ahead and rolled with it. But now I think I've got it where it's a little bit better, so hopefully um, we won't have the same noise issues in these clips as we did in some of the previous ones. So again, the idea here is just to shield out any uh, RF interference, that's radio frequency interference coming into, <clears throat> into uh, our signal. From the guitar and this will just quiet things down this is really especially important if you're recording which he is doing a lot of recording so this is something that um for sure needs to be done to this guitar some of you might be asking why didn't they do this from the factory well that's you know probably a good question they did have this shielding over here and the pickups themselves to be fair are shielded um the the body the, the windings of the pickups are shielded um, by the metal plate that's on the bottom of the pickups. Uh, and the fact that it's a hum, humbucker, the fact that, uh, well, the factory ones weren't humbucking. So, I don't know. I'm not sure why they wouldn't have shielded it. It's possible that this um, paint has some shielding in the paint. Um, but I'm not sure on that one. So... We're just, we're just not going to take any chances with it. That's the bottom line. And this doesn't cost anything to do this. I mean, this is, this is actually aluminum shielding tape. So this is like um, tape that you, you would use for duct work and things like that. Uh, you can get this at Harbor Freight. Uh, this is the HFT brand stuff. Um, you can probably also get similar stuff on Amazon. I'll post a link in the description uh, where you can get stuff like this. But um, yeah, it definitely helps if you don't have the shielded paint that you can paint your cavities with. Uh, this stuff works just as well. It's very cheap. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just as good. Aluminum shielding is just as good as, as, uh, as brass or copper shielding. Aluminum is just as good of a conductor. One more little piece right here to kind of tie these two bits together. All right. So there's that cavity fully shielded. Um, I have kind of a bridge over here to this cavity, um, bridging those two pieces together. So that should form hopefully a, a more complete Faraday cage, uh, which will shield noise much, much better than before. Now there's room to actually get to the ball ends of the string. You should be able to restring this thing without having to get, you know, a tool up under there now. Okay, it's time to put a few finishing touches on this thing. Uh, we need to replace the magic juju bead that this thing came with. So we'll put this in the back and tape it down. 
Apparently, Juju is also a name of a type of music that comes from West Africa. In addition to describing any object that carries magical powers, I think that's also the derivation of the word mojo. Juju, mojo. Here we're going to put a little sticker on here that uh, I got at NAM. I think it was uh, Amplified Parts sticker that I just cut a hole in the center of it. Uh, because it just looks funky and cool, he gave the okay on that. We're going to put Kalium strings on this. If you guys are interested in uh, checking out Kalium strings, I'll put a link down in the description. Uh, these were sent to me for free uh, by the owner of the company, and I, I like them so far. Now, I know I had said I wasn't going to do any fret work on this guitar, but I changed my mind midstream. Uh, I took a second look at these, and I you know, saw a few nicks here and there. There's one on that fret right there. You can see up on the uh, near the high E, just kind of an indentation there that really needs to come out. There were a couple of other areas, too. There's a nick on that one. And down low on the cowboy chords down here as well, there were some more uh, little dimples and things that... I knew I could get out if I just spent a little time with it, so I decided to go ahead and do a little bit of fret work. Here we're going to start with some leveling. Moving on to the crowning tool. I know some of you guys will ask, why didn't you use the guard with the crowning tool also? Well, because... If you go slow with the crowning tool, um, it just works a lot better for me to do it without this little guard in place. But I do usually use it on uh, the fret stick because I tend to slip more with the fret stick. Then we're going to move on to some fret erasers. We will start with the coarsest grit first and then move our way up. So we're starting with the 220 in this case. And I just kind of dispense with the formality and just put the eraser down on its side to get multiple frets at once. I like to clean up after myself kind of midway through. That way it just it doesn't kind of clog up because a lot of times these erasers can sort of clog up. So, But after we get done with all the various erasers, we will give the fretboard a little wipe down here and uh, look it over one final time before we put the strings on. And as you can see, they look a lot more polished, a lot more finished. Uh, you don't see any of the dimples that we had in there before. The pickup was a bit high and it was rattling against the string, so we're just lower that down. We can uh, we can adjust this for optimum sound in a bit, but for now we just need to get it out of the way of the strings so that we can intonate and we'll be ready to demo this thing. But before we demonstrate the tone, I wanted to speak to the owner of the guitar, Matthew Melton from the band Dream Machine, and get his perspective and backstory on this unique instrument. This is my only guitar right now. Times got tough, so I sold some backup guitars. I had a uh, had an Ovation Viper that was pretty cool, and uh, I, I had to part ways with that one and went down to only one guitar. So that's where I'm at right now. Vipers are cool too, but the Breadwinner just has such an awesome shape, you know. And I just felt like, you know, when I picked it up, it just felt right. We're recording our third album. It's coming along really nicely. We got the drums all recorded, so we're about to get into tracking bass, guitars, keys, vocals, all the good stuff. And uh, yeah, that, that guitar, I've been through the ringer. I bought it in 2010 and then it went on just just tour after tour after tour, hundreds of shows with that guitar. I should mention, I was mentioned before about that pickup, the DiMaggio uh, Super Distortion. That's actually from a very weird and interesting guitar um, I'll try and pull up a picture of it for you, but it was from a 1963 uh, Gibson SG Jr. that was from my uncle, my uncle Dennis Melton, and I played the hell out of that thing. And actually, the neck kept breaking, you know, on those uh, SGs, SG Juniors, they have that 
kind of a Achilles heel of that neck that always breaks. I like screwed a can opener on the back to like support the the neck of the guitar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but th this this uh, this breadwinner has got so many stories on it. I actually can't tell you a lot of them because your your whole YouTube channel would get b banned immediately. But um, I mean, <laughs> we've had some fun times with that thing. One time we were coming back from a European tour, flying from Paris to Austin, Texas, and the stewardess comes over to us and uh, she could kind of see we were a band together on the plane. And she's like, hey, just so you know, Ace Freely is up in first class, I just, you know, from Kiss. And I just thought I'd let you guys know you were, you know, and we were like, well, let's go. Ace Freely's on the plane. I just thought I'd violate his privacy. <laughs> I know. It's like, well, we actually yeah. don't like Ace Freely. And we're going to go up there. And no, we we were like, that's so cool. <laughs> we ran into him. We hate it. He owes I know. You're money. like, Ace Freely? <laughs> that's... <laughs> We ride where we wanted, man. No. Apparently, no, she didn't we... see the picture of you with the switchblade. <laughs> yeah. So I hope you don't have that. I on. love that picture, man. That was like, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Menacing. <laughs> but <clears throat> no, we ran into Ace getting off the airplane, and he kind of saw us. He saw we were abandoned and kind of gave us like a like a nod of approval. And we were like, oh, cool. And I showed him the guitar, but it was like in passing. You know, he had his bags and yeah. stuff. So I didn't want to be like... Oh my God, he's a super cool. fan. You know, we were yeah. cool. We were cool about it, and I was just, but you know, it's like, also, you know, it's that's Ace cool Freely. though. That it's re what's really cool about it is that Ace uh, played one of those, and that you exactly. know, he laid his eyes on yours. That's kind of neat. You know, he I had to go cool. away thinking. I know. Hey, I remember that guitar. You know, I know. At, at the time, I was, I was like, "What should I, should I ask him?" You know, I was like, "I don't really want to be like, can I have an autograph?" So I just kept it cool, and you know, we had a very cool interaction in passing but yeah it was funny i was like would you believe i have a white uh ovation breadwinner in this case he's like no kidding <laughs> you know it, it was it was cool <laughs>